Welcome once again into the Radiopedia Reading Room, a podcast unconcerned with books or poetry, tea leaves or palmistry. It is but a humble radiology podcast. My name is Andrew Dixon and joining me with a 100% success rate in predicting Academy Award Best Picture winners, it's my co-host Frank Gaylard. Well done. Oh, thank you. It just goes to show that you don't actually have to see most of the movies to be able to <laughs> predict it. You just read the tea leaves, mate. That's right. That's how I report MRs too. <laughs> <laughs> did you enjoy the fashions on the red carpet this year? I, I actually didn't know that the Academy Awards had already run. It wasn't a red carpet. It was actually a champagne carpet, so controversial. I, I did not know any of these things. I just heard that the best uh, best picture was uh, correctly identified by yours truly, and that's uh, actually all I know. You actually need to know that that reds and purples and whites were the colours this year. Uh, floral embellishments were also in. <laughs> the Rock wore a ballet pink coat this year, wow. which was which was lovely. Was there a lot um, of Radiopedia purple out there? No, nah, not so much. Not so mm. much. Uh, maybe next year. Will these fashion trends influence your your wardrobe over the next few months, Frank? No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so today's episode is an abdominal imaging panel discussion from Radiopedia 2022, hosted by the smoothest voice in radiology. Who's that, Frank? Our very own Vikas Shah. Yes, yes. And featuring fellow abdominal radiologists and Radiopedia editors, Michael Hartung, and Matt Morgan. Matt, we had on the podcast a few weeks ago. In fact, you described him as having dulcet tones, Frank. So it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a voice off Vickers versus Matt in this episode. I don't think Michael's got a real chance in this, (laughs) not compared to Vickers and Matt. So Matt is from the University of Philadelphia Health System. Michael, I don't think we've featured on the podcast yet. This is his first week. So he's an abdominal radiologist from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And Frank, we all know from previous episodes what Wisconsin is famous for, right? Delicious beer brats. <laughs> That's but, right. Um, That's you right. know, speaking of uh, meat-derived products, I- I've got a meat update for our no. special feature. Really? Am I going to allow this? This is really important. Go for it. Last time we spoke, we spoke about meat substitutes that were made of soy and genetically mm-hmm. engineered heme, but soon the FDA is going to approve some vat-grown meat, like real meat, muscle-grown oh, in a really? vat. Yeah, so which will be microscopically and genetically and in every other possible way indistinguishable from a chunk of meat taken from an animal, which is, you know, pretty interesting as well. But what's Particularly interesting is that there's a company that is promising to offer rare and endangered vat grown meats so that you can have like panda steak or (laughs) tiger burger. Really? (laughs) Yeah. But I don't think it should stop there. Why not have celebrity meat? You're promoting cannibalism on the podcast. Well, I'm just saying you could have like The Rock. Brad Brad Pitt burger. (laughs) (laughs) Brad Pitt's armpit. It does, uh, it, it does raise some ethical questions, perhaps. Yeah. But is it cannibalism if no human was harmed in the process of obtaining yes. human meat? It's a good point. You could almost argue that using human meat for human consumption is more ethical than using other animals' meat in this context, in the context of lab-grown. It's the only person that could give consent to have their meat grown. That's right. Written informed <laughs> consent. Grow my muscles. I'm concerned about this discussion, I must say. We could bring out our own range of meat. <laughs> <laughs> the Radiopedia meat collection. Oh, mate. I think we should get into this week's panel discussion. It's hosted by Vikas Shah. Uh, it was recorded just after Matt Morgan had given a lecture entitled Gastric Cancer, Getting the Important Info to the Table, and Michael Hartong, a lecture called Complex Small Bowel Obstructions. Both can be found in our abdominal lecture collection over on the website. So let's listen in, and then Frank and I will be back for another non-meat-related chat at the end. Okay, so we're now joined by the speakers of those two talks, Matt Morgan and Michael Harting. So those are really fantastic talks. Matt, your love of 90s video games really shines through in all of the lectures I've watched. Uh, You're a big fan, right? 
Oh yeah, it's it's my theme for my talks. It's uh, <laughs> I play video games. I try to work some of my personal life into my into my talks. You know, it makes it fun. One thing I wanted to comment on, and I think all three of us as abdominal radiologists will have come across this. There are organs in the abdominal cavity that are overcalled as being abnormal when in fact their appearance is within the normal range, right? And I think the stomach falls yeah. within that category. Um, and you must have experience of of discussing that with clinical colleagues who've seen reports where the stomach's overcalled, but and endoscopy it's normal. So do you have any tips for how to avoid overcalling stomach wall thickening? Yeah, man, that is a great question. Because you're right. I mean, the, the stomach, especially the gastric fundus, the proximal stomach, that's an area where people really are just kind of all over the map, especially when they're beginning. The more gastric cancer you see, you sort of build a sense for what's normal and what's abnormal. That comes with experience. But if you want a shortcut, I think some of the things that can be useful are um, keeping in mind how distended the stomach is. So if the stomach is collapsed, you don't want to overcall it. Um, but if the stomach is more distended and you see thickening, then you can feel more confident. I find it's very helpful to look at the stomach in different planes. Um, sometimes something will look sort of abnormal. And when you're looking at the axial plane, then you go into the coronal plane. It's like, oh, actually, you know what? That kind of fades in with the rest of the um, gastric wall there. So maybe that, that's normal or the sagittal plane, whatever, whatever it looks right. As if you want to, if you're going to call it abnormality, it should look kind of abnormal in more than one plane. So I, I find that that's useful. Abnormal enhancements, um, both ways, actually too much enhancement or too little enhancement, enhancement, hypo enhancement, something that really stands out from background can really sort of tip you towards saying there might be something abnormal there. So why do I say that they can differentiate from something where you just have, it seems like it's thick, but it's really enhancing like the rest of the mucosa. In that case, it may just be kind of a big, thick fold. And so you don't want to overcall that. And there's a, there's other things too, that you can learn, but it's, uh, it, it's definitely somewhere you want to sort of especially when you're beginning, try to a little bit with caution. And if it's abnormal, try to see if it's abnormal on multiple planes. Yeah. So maybe actually a good tip for uh, anyone training is if you can go away and find a whole lot of examples of stomachs mm. that are proven to be abnormal, and then you have that as your database of abnormal and work work your way backwards, that might be helpful, right? Yeah, and th that actually brings up something else too. You want to look for those secondary signs if you're going to think of a, a mass or a cancer. If you see something that looks like it's thickened and you see adjacent lymphadenopathy, well, then you're going to start tipping more toward there might be an underlying mass here. And then, you know, scoping is is the next step at that point. So one of those things you mentioned is when you're deciding to call a stomach abnormal, look for, see if it's distended or not, right? So right. when you're actually doing an evaluation for proven gastric cancer and you're doing the CT study for staging, do you distend the stomach with any form of um, oral contrast? That's an interesting question. So yes, that would be the right thing to do. And uh, we try to do it with a negative oral contrast agent. So we try to do it with something like uh, usually water. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, you could use some other fancier, more expensive negative oral contrast agents. But a lot of those are, they're designed to sort of stay within the small bowel. You know, that's part of their value for enterography. And here you're just looking at the stomach. Mm -hmm. So even though the water empties, empties from the stomach relatively quickly, it's probably not going to empty so fast that you can't get a good distended um, image of the stomach. Why negative oral contrast? You really want to take a look at the mucosa. You want to see that enhancement of the mucosa. And if you have positive oral contrast in there, you have sort of white on white, and it'd be hard to pick out subtle areas of increased or uh, enhanced or decreased enhancement, actually. The, the, the one caveat to that is that we often don't get a chance to use our CT gastric protocol because frequently these patients come rolling in without a, a diagnosis. So they end up getting positive oral contrast because you're, you're looking for something else. So it is useful to sort of look at both, sort of build your eye in both situations because it's frequently you're going to have to have to make the call with positive oral contrast on board but ideally you'd have the negative yeah and talking about positive oral contrast michael i noticed that a lot of the cts that you use in your teaching for small bowel obstruction and other acute abdominal conditions have got oral contrast on board and i was just reflecting on my own experience in the uk where we don't really use a lot of oral contrast for acute abdominal ct such as for small bowel obstruction so how how does it help you with the diagnosis yeah i think the the use of oral contrast depends you know on the institution and i think what kind of patterns have been ingrained um over the many years and so in my institution it's just been something that we've done traditionally although Recently, we have been using it less and less in the emergency department setting and shifting more to problem solving inpatients or complex patients, postoperative patients, and then for cancer um, staging and restaging more on the outpatient basis. Because um, I think it does have issues with you know patient tolerance and throughput. 
I personally, I've done practice with and without it. And I, I think a lot of the diagnoses that I showed could, you know, the oral contrast didn't necessarily provide a lot of helpful information. And, you know, I'm not the one having to drink it when I'm really sick. So I'm sure it's not always pleasant, you know, for the patients doing it. Um, but I do think sometimes it can be helpful for problem solving. It can help speed up your reading a little bit um, when you can find that transition point faster because you can ignore the bowel loops that have some, you know, oral contrast slowly gradating towards the transition, although fecalization can tip you off too. So it's, you know, how much did that really add? I think some in some cases like a perforated ulcer, um, I've been very confident about locating it, particularly if you can't use IV contrast. I think it's really helpful, you know, because at least it's something, something provide potential information. And, you know, for thin patients, um, I think it also is fairly helpful to help distinguish intra-abdominal structures. So yeah, I, I think it, you know, it depends upon the practice and, but I think there are still some, you know, uses for it um, in times where I have found it helpful. It's so going back to thinking about gastric cancer just for a moment, um, Matt, I think one of the most difficult episodes uh, for patients and also for their, the surgeons caring for them and actually the whole team is if they go in to do a resection and then they found that the tumor is unresectable. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that happens is invasion into the diaphragm. And that sometimes, you know, that seems to be difficult to diagnose in CT. Do you have any tips on, on how to look for that or how to diagnose Ooh, that? Um, that can be very hard. Obviously, you're going to have a higher likelihood of that occurring if you're dealing with a proximal gastric cancer. So mm -hmm. delineating exactly the extent of the tumor within the stomach can be useful in terms of deciding whether you're going to make that call mm -hmm. or not. You know, the, the diaphragm might occur right in and around the, the gastric cardia. So you already have some thickening right there. You'd have to see something that was over and above that sort of level of thickening. And it can be, it, it, you don't want to overcall lymphadenopathy and the you know, gastropathic ligament is tumorous extending into the crur, that sort of thing. It can be tough. It can be tough. I think the important thing is number one, you're aware that it can, can occur. So if it is grossly invading the diaphragm, you can make that call. It's like, oh, I never even knew that could happen. Um, so that's, it's good to know that it can occur. I think one thing you could do potentially is if you see an abnormality in the diaphragm itself, like if it's affecting the, the innervation of the diaphragm, then you can see some weakness in there. I mean, I, I suppose you could send the patient to, for a, a SNP study, which is a fluoroscopic study where you watch the diaphragm move. So you see there's some asymmetry. If there's a question on the CT that, hey, maybe there's some invasion, that might be a relatively quick way of just checking the diaphragm out. It doesn't prove that it's not invading, but if you see an abnormality that can really make you start thinking in terms of uh, there could be a problem here. The situation where metastatic disease or, or local unresectable local invasion is not called um, ahead of time, it can be really tough on patients. It, it does happen frequently, especially with carcinomatosis. You know, they make the incision, they put their hand in there, they feel around, they feel something that's kind of like sandpaper, and then they, they back out. For carcinomatosis, that's just a limitation of uh, CT, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, it's beyond the limit of resolution, right, of what, yeah. what we can see on CT. Yeah. Michael, um, I just want to ask you about not necessarily complex obstruction, but say you've got a case of a relatively straightforward adhesional small bile obstruction with no particularly complicating features. Do you have any experience of these patients being administered oral contrast, such as gastrographin, for therapeutic and diagnostic effects? Yeah, we have a protocol or a specific study that can be ordered called a water soluble contrast challenge. And one of the benefits back to the first question about oral contrast and, you know, in the ER for the setting of obstruction up front is that um, you can kind of basically use a modified protocol to follow the transit of that contrast you gave for the study. And though even so it's, uh, even though it's a little bit more dilute, we can follow it at four and 12 hours to see how far it is transited and, and, uh, or, you know, kind of any interval for that uh, of interest there. But um, generally speaking, you know, starting the protocol over from scratch, the surgeons are interested in seeing if the contrast transit to the colon within 24 hours, which will indicate that non-operative management will be successful and there might be some therapeutic benefit. So our basic protocol is we give 150 mLs of uh, Omnipake, which is water soluble contrast uh, used for CT uh, bedside, clamp the NG for one hour, and then do our first image at eight hours and then 24 hours. Um, if at eight hours, it's in the colon. We don't do a follow up, but then we'll do that twenty four hour follow up if it hasn't made it there yet. So, those are the the different ways you can use it with the contrast that they got for the original CT, or you can order the separate water soluble contrast challenge. Okay, 
And now if we move on to, you know, the other end of the spectrum, so complex mobile obstruction, right, which is your, what your talk is all about, but thinking about complexity in the form of complications, such as if you're worried about ischemia. So for anyone who doesn't know, Michael, you had a really great paper in radiographics last year about how to write a great radiology report. And you also recorded a video for Radiopedia, which is available to view. So using that experience and your knowledge and expertise in that area, what's the best way to relay concern in the radiology report itself? So to differentiate for the surgeon between the patient who's got just some simple obstruction, which is likely to relieve by itself, versus that person who you're just worried about because it doesn't quite look right. You know, you, you're thinking about ischemia. How do you relay that? Yeah, well, thanks. And that's a that's a great and a tough question. I think one that I kind of wrestle with with every, any challenging case, and I'm always tweaking and kind of modifying my views on it. Um, so I think it, I think what it comes down to is like when you're reporting these cases, are you delivering a clear definitive diagnosis, you know, such as a single point, you know, from a single point obstruction with adhesive disease to closed loop obstruction to clear ischemia, or are you kind of delivering the possibility with some concern? If you're, if you're giving a clear diagnosis, then deliver that clearly unequivocally so that the you know you're kind of directing management but if you're bringing up some features of the you know like you know questionable pneumatosis or maybe subtle hypo enhancement or some areas of congestion you're not really sure what to make of or maybe there's an internal hernia that can you know there's some swirling but it's a little weird or something like that then you're really kind of i, I see us taking a little bit more of a, a role alongside of the surgeons and saying well what do you think clinically what do the labs look like what does your serial abdominal exam show for those kind of reports, I try to be a lot more conversational and just say, you know, okay. this is a this is a, you know a small bowel obstruction with some concerning features. You know, I even use the, sometimes the personal pronoun. I see, you know, some swirling here that makes me concerned, or I find unusual, or I'm un, un, unsure how to what the significance of, but it could be ischemia, and so I would recommend low threshold for repeating the imaging. But I really assume a more conversational tone. Yeah, I think calling, picking up the phone and, and talking to somebody is really tempting, but a lot of times you're going to get, you might get the ER resident or physician who's going to transfer the patient to surgery. And then, you know, it's going to work its way up the chain of command. And so those nuances that you try to communicate over the phone, mm -hmm. um, it's important to do that, but they can be lost in, you know, yeah. through a game of telephone, literally. And uh, putting that in the report and kind of having that as an anchoring document of what we think and what we're concerned about, I think is really helpful and then just really relaying to them that have a low threshold to put the patient, bring the patient back to the scanner, you know, to follow this up. If they, you know, clinically decompensate, bring them back right away. And I've just found that when you flag the patients as such, they get really careful of serial exams. And as soon as something changes, you know, they're either going to take them for exploration or re-image them and they don't really fall through the cracks as much. Yeah. Any yeah. thoughts? This is, it's a tough one. I think I'm sure we've all experienced it. Any, any thoughts on reporting uh, these tough cases? No, I, I mean, my personal thoughts are the same, which is, you know, if you develop that conversational style, and I guess if your surgeons are familiar with your style of reporting, they will soon pick up your concern in your words. And exactly, I think speaking to people, like you said, in, in the way medicine works now with shift systems, the message could very easily get lost. So I guess it's um, persistence and trying to speak to as many people about this as possible to make sure that someone gets that message and it's not lost, you know, between different members of the team. Well, thank you both for joining me for this um, conversation. Thank you both for those excellent lectures. What we're going to have now is uh, another talk. In fact, this one is uh, another one by you, Michael. This one is Cancer Mimics in the abdomen and pelvis um, and stick around after that um, and I'm going to go through some live cases so I'll see you after this talk. Thanks again to Vikas Shah, smoothest voice in radiology for hosting that panel. He's been doing some other awesome hosting work over on our uh, YouTube channel doing the free Friday live streams in the lead up to Radiopedia 2023 along with Amanda Err. So if you haven't uh, haven't been watching those, then head over to the featured video page on Radiopedia and you can catch up on the, the latest live stream. I'll, I'll drop a link in the show notes perhaps to that page. Uh, quite a few things to chat about from that panel discussion, Frank. 
Mm-hmm. I liked the the database of abnormal stomachs that Vickers suggested to help get your eye in for differentiating normal from abnormal. That kind of stood out to me as an idea. Yeah, that made me think of a term that's that's used. I've actually done a little bit of, well, collaborated on some research with the university on what's called perceptual learning. Do you know what perceptual learning is? I probably should explain it for our dear listeners. You can just pretend that you know I know exactly what it is, but if you could, if you could just uh, let the less informed know. The the best example um, that's used when describing perceptual learning is uh, baby chickens, chicks. Apparently, when baby chicks are born, they all look very, very similar, uh, and you can't easily distinguish a male chick from a female chick. It's not like mm-hmm. there's some you know particular bit of anatomy that's easy to see, like male cloaca versus female cloaca. They all look the same. Um, And to a novice, it's basically impossible to tell them apart. So you're just, you're down to chance, 50-50. But people who do this a lot can easily sort them within, you know, microseconds. And you see these uh, pictures of chicken farms, factories, I don't know, with a conveyor belt of chicks and people are just tossing these chicks at a rate of, you know, three per second, and they're highly accurate. But if you ask them, what do you look for? They can't really tell you. It looks like a male chick or it looks like a female chick, but it's not a particular feature. So how did they learn in the first place? They got feedback or? The key to learning this kind of thing is high volume, immediate feedback. So Mm -hmm. all you need to do is stand next to someone and you pick up a chick and you say, I think it's male. And they go, yep. That's male. And then you pick up the next one. You say, I think this one's female. And you go, no, that one's male too. You don't even need to give any specific feedback. And if you do that enough and fast enough uh, and high volume enough, then you can achieve proficiency in these particular tasks really, really quickly. The research we did on it was uh, on hip fractures taking psychology undergraduate students from the university Yeah, so no experience at all. Had no experience of x-rays and showed them uh, images uh, of hips that were either broken or not broken. We didn't tell them anything about what a broken hip looks like. Many of them were sort of fairly subtle, undisplaced neck of femur fractures. And what we showed is that within half an hour of training, they were as good as MSK consultant radiologists in Hmm. picking hip fractures off a single AP view. Now, obviously, they don't know how to pick impingement or Ewing sarcoma or Paget's disease or anything else. But this one task can be taught really easily. And in fact, it's very similar to how we train AI networks. Absolutely. Um, That's what I was thinking. But so this kind of small bowel or stomach, is this normal or isn't, is that kind of thing? Someone like Vickers can probably explain to you what they're looking for. But I'm not convinced that that explanation isn't sort of post hoc, as in they know it's a normal stomach and then they're kind of coming up with explanations to explain why they think it's a normal stomach. But actually what comes first is the feeling that this is a normal stomach. And you only get that, as you say, by having a really large database of normal and abnormal stomachs and just looking through thousands of cases. And, And so in our training... You know, that, that's what we should be focusing on, yeah. high volume. That's essentially what radiology training is. And that's why I think uh, when trainees come to our hospital in particular, one of the reasons why they choose our hospital is because they know that we have a very large amount of after hours emergency department work hmm. and that they get a- access to a large number of studies and are expected to report a large number of studies with independence making their own decisions. Yeah, I think that's crucial. Whereas some other institutions, you know, they're, they're quite protected. They have very little access to that kind of that kind of setting. And so I think it's really important, yeah, to, to dial your, your gauge into what's normal, what's abnormal, to have that exposure to lots of cases, but also, you know, independently doing them without a consultant holding your hand all the time. Well, and I think that's a key point that you need for this process to work, you need to commit to what you think. And then you need to be corrected. Yep. If you just look at it and you think, oh, it might be fractured or it might not be fractured, I'll show the boss. Then you don't learn anything from that. You have to be willing to say, I believe this is a normal stomach. 
you need high volume, but you need consultants to give the autonomy to trainees mm -hmm. to do that. And you need trainees to be willing to be wrong and to be wrong sort of semi-publicly because you need an interim report out there. Um, and that's fine. Teaching hospitals are like that. But I've worked in places where, as you say, that's not done. And uh, trainees are encouraged to spend more time reading books and not reporting as much. And, and I think that's completely backwards from uh, what you want to do to get good quickly. I remember a case where probably one of the first times I was on call as a first year registrar and it was a CT brain and I think it went down and you could see the parotid glands on it. And they looked, they looked like water density. And I never actually thought about that before. And I was like, oh, these are abnormal. They're, they're certainly not, you know, soft tissue density. These are, you know, yeah, they're measuring zero Hounsfield units. So I put it in my report and then, you know, very experienced radiologist uh, removed that from my report or corrected it and said, that's what parotids look like. And then you look at all these other studies and you realize, yeah. yep, that's what parotids generally look like. They're almost always very similar to water density. So again, I just didn't have the number of studies that I looked at to really dial in to know what a normal parotid gland looks like. I've even tried to uh, coin a term for this, which um, I've so far been unsuccessful, but who knows? Here we go. Okay. We all know what an aunt mini is. Mm -hmm. Benjamin Felsen, you know, coined the term saying, how do you know if you see Aunt Minnie walking towards you down the street? And it's like, well, it just looks like Aunt Minnie. And what you described there, something that you've actually seen repeatedly but never noticed is dull Uncle George, <laughs> where it's the relative that has been at every family gathering for as long as you've been alive, <laughs> but you never notice them. <laughs> Yeah. And until one day, it's like, oh, who's that dude? And it's like, <laughs> oh, that's Uncle George. He's seriously, he's been there every single time we meet. You know, yeah, I never noticed that. And, and I've had a bunch. Don't let well. him take you into a room by yourself. <laughs> 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 Sorry, continue. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that that's a, a really common experience to not have noticed something repeatedly. And that just comes with experience. But it also comes with knowledge. And anatomy is a bit like that. If you don't know what the anatomy is meant to be like, it's not that you just don't know the words for it. You actually don't notice features. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no shortcut for, for that. You just need years and thousands and thousands of cases, which is, you know, incidentally, one of the reasons why Radiopedia started was to bring together hundreds and hundreds of cases that you can look at together so that when you're trying to learn the difference between bronchiectasis and pulmonary fibrosis, um, you don't just read about the features, you create a playlist with 50 of each mm -hmm. and then you test yourself. And by the time you finish that, you'll just know which one it is without necessarily being able to explain what features you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, oral contrast was uh, another thing that was mentioned quite a bit in this panel discussion, negative oral contrast for assessment of the stomach. And then Michael spoke about his local use of positive oral contrast for abdominal CT. I must say that at the Alfred, it's exceedingly rare that we use positive oral contrast for abdominal CT these days. And certainly uh, we haven't used it in the emergency setting for many, many years. What's your experience at Royal Melbourne, Frank? Um, I'm going to pretend I know the answer to this because <laughs> I don't spend that much time in, in emergency. But no, we've had a similar experience. We used to, when I trained, we gave oral contrast to everyone. And it mm -hmm. used to be this thing where we would actually, even in the emergency setting, we'll be, you know, forcing uh, patients to wait an hour for their appendix scan because they'd had to have their oral contrast. And I'm pretty sure now that we only use it for complicated inpatients uh, where there's some specific question that is going to be better assessed with yeah. oral contrast. And as a routine, certainly in the emergency department, we don't give oral contrast. Either. In my emergency radiology course, I like to say that the only reason for giving pos positive oral contrast for an abdominal emergency CT is to delay the scan by a couple of hours so someone else <laughs> has to report it rather than me. <laughs> Always gets a little chuckle in the room, that one. Vic has mentioned Michael's How to Write a Great Radiology Report, the radiographics article and the lecture that he recorded for us in the past. Mm -hmm. I should probably reach out to Michael and see if he's interested in recording an audio version of that for the podcast. What do you think? Mm, that would be good. Or even just have him on as a guest. Let me, um, let, let me take that on as homework and I'll see what I can do. Michael also described sometimes how he, he writes his reports in the first person. 
um, a conversational style, particularly if there's some nuance to it that he wants to get across. Do you ever do anything like that, Frank? Not often. Um, I do when I think that my opinion is possibly not the opinion that most of my colleagues would come to. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, that's not so much maybe nuance, but where I'm speculating more than I think yep. uh, just the imaging would say, then I might drop an eye in, but I don't tend to. There was a consultant when I was training who would, in their reports, refer to the patient by their first name, which I always oh, yeah. found was very odd, which is like George's spleen is shattered into a thousand <laughs> pieces. <laughs> I, I, I occasionally do use the patient's name in obstetric cases where there's fetal loss or something like that, where it is more personal and you have had a discussion with a patient, I will sometimes use mm. the person's name. With regards to first person, the only time I really use it is when I am putting an addendum on a registrar's preliminary report where I often agree with what they've said, but I want to add a slightly different context to it. So I'll say, you know, uh, you know, I agree with the above findings uh, in addition, and then I'll go on and give my kind of take on it. What do you do when an interim report is incorrect or you disagree with it? Do you say, I disagree with this report or do you just edit the report? It uh, depends. If it was very much only just released a few seconds ago, I will edit the report directly. But if it's already been out uh, and actioned upon, I will add an addendum. And yeah, I won't say I disagree, but I will just issue my my findings for the report. But if I do agree generally with what they've said, I will say, you know, I agree with all the above findings. My interpretation, however, would be slightly different and I'd give that. Uh, that's interesting because that's a very different model to the one that we use. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? we have uh, interim reports and encourage our registrars to put out interim reports for all studies where they are not equivocating between two conclusions that are vastly different. Right. So if they really don't know what's going on and on one hand they think it might be cancer or it might be normal, then we ask them to just ask someone first. Uh, but that's 1% of reports. So all other reports go out uh, with a preliminary report that just says it's a preliminary report. But then when we review them, we just edit them so that the final report is just the final report. There's no uh, record of what the interim report was mm -hmm. that's user-facing. That is kept in, in our RIS. So if you ever need to, there is a log of every version of the report that's out. But the final report will just be uh, the findings and the conclusion. And at the bottom, it says, you know, Joe Bloggs, radiology registrar. And then my sign off is images reviewed with Frank Gaylard. Mm -hmm. We used to do a bit of that. But what we found was that the preliminary reports, which are accessible to people in the hospital straight away, were often being copied and then pasted mm -hmm. into the patient's notes. And then when the finalised report comes back and they're quite contradictory, we were getting into issues where people were going, oh, but we did this because the report said this. And so from that point forward, when that was raised, we decided to favour uh, putting an actual addendum at the bottom of the report so the original one is still there, what the registrar wrote at the time, and then we give our adjustments to it. Um, but it does depend on, it depends on the context a bit. You don't feel that that draws attention to the errors and potentially leads to in, like self-contradictory reports where the findings will say one thing, but then your addendum, like doesn't that yes. end up being more complicated? And how do the trainees feel about uh, thoughts that I expressed at the time when this was discussed? But from a mm. um, from a, a hospital wide point of view, the decision was made that it it was better overall to make it clear what the preliminary report was. Uh, and what the the adjustment from the consultant was so that when an initial report says you know there's a, a small bowel obstruction with a transition point here and then they go and operate and then there's an addendum to the or an adjustment to the report and it just says normal small bowel then you know the surgeon is not upset they can go back and show you the initial report that they acted upon yeah we've taken the approach of just trying to make the fact that this is an interim report as obvious and hard to miss as possible and explicitly saying this can change and um yeah. 
we do that, but they still cut and paste and put it in the in the medical record. They do, but at the same time, I I really don't want anything to discourage my trainees from putting out a report, which goes to mm-hmm. what we were talking about before. You you need to kind of commit and you need to act, uh, knowing that your consultants have your back and that they won't you know, highlight your mistakes. And in fact, the same person that used to refer to patients by their first name in the report uh, was the one person that used to put at the end of the report, I disagree with the interim report. You know, (laughs) this small bowel is completely normal. And uh, that caused a lot of uh, anxiety amongst trainees and rightfully so. There's definitely a skill to writing the addendum so you're not throwing your trainee under the bus and so that it's a learning experience for them, but also that it communicates exactly what's happened. But this is this is a big it's a big issue, a big topic we could talk about another time as mm. well. We probably should wrap things up. Frank, how can people get in contact with us? Well, as always, we are on uh, at Radiopedia on Twitter and Instagram, as well as at Frank Gaylord and at Dr. Andrew Dixon. And you can email us at podcast at radiopedia.org with any ideas or feedback. You can, of course, help support Radiopedia generally by becoming a paid supporter or purchasing an all-access pass to our entire online course and conference backlog. And and what else can people do, Frank? They can, of course, leave us a five-star review in the podcast app of your choosing. Now, before I do the sign-off, Frank, something to actually help with the sign-off. Do you know what a scratch voice is? Is it like a scratch take, like a filler voice? Yeah, so like a scratch vocal would be when like a music artist you know, creates the the song and they sing it themselves, but then for the star to actually sing. So the star right. kind of mimics what their performance is. And <laughs> okay. the same thing actually happens in animated films, yep. right? So in animated films, like 20 years ago, you know, Little Mermaid or whatever, there were not actually stars doing the voices for those characters. It was just people who are really good voice actors. But these days, they always want to have a star doing the voice for the characters. Yep. So what they actually do is get these scratch vocal performers to do the initial reading to work out you know the cadence which which words to emphasize how to say it and then the hollywood star comes in and actually mimics what this <laughs> scratch vocal performer has done so with that in mind the daughter of the podcast she's nine years old she has recorded for you frank a scratch vocal of her <laughs> saying stay rad so i'm going to play that for you now you ready and i have to imitate it yeah 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 you've oh, got to right, right. you've got to you've got to imitate this now she's given you, and this is a single take, she's given you four versions. Four <laughs> versions, single take. You ready? All right. Listening is listening is on. Stay rad. Stay rad. Stay rad. Stay rad, guys. <laughs> <laughs> how was that? That was much better than anything I can do. That is how you do it. That was a single take, boom, straight in. And then I said, oh, I said, you rustled your clothing a bit there. Do you want to do it again? And she's like, no, I think that's good enough. And then she walked out of the room. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> it was great. All right. So I want to hear something like that when we sign off. So we'll catch you all again sometime soon in the reading room. Stay rad, everyone. Oh, Oh, come on. I'll get the daughter of the podcast to assess that and let us know. (laughs) We'll get feedback for next week. All right. See you again next week, Frank. Bye-bye, Dixon. 